And without any further ado, Miles, Showtime. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys so much for coming out. I really appreciate it. Uh, this is awesome. I've only been in New York a couple months, but it's so great to have the support from uh, the ARE here. All right, uh, I'd like to in invite you know any higher beings, uh, angels, avatars, masters to be with us. Maybe Mr. Casey and his peers uh, who we'll be discussing tonight as well. My name is Miles Blinn Tufts. I'm going to be 28 next month. But um, my whole life I've asked the bigger questions. Uh, I remember looking up at the sky and uh, wondering why we're here, what does it all mean? In sixth grade, I remember my teacher asked us we could write a, a paper on any topic we wanted. A lot of kids wrote about some athletes and some historical figures, and I told my teacher mine would be about uh, the topic of perspective. She wasn't too thrilled, but in the end she wanted to keep the paper, so I assumed she was uh, pretty happy with it. So that's kind of who I am, and uh, I never resonated with religion uh, my whole life, but uh, a couple years ago I found something that for the first time made sense and, and resonated with uh, myself, And but I didn't just uh, I'm a skeptic, so I didn't just want to believe blindly. I wanted to be able to prove it. So that's what I'm going to try to do tonight. The topic uh, is called Going for God, Answering Life's Biggest Questions to the Source of the Sleeping Prophets. I'll start off with my story. I was born in the small town of Wolfboro, New Hampshire. That's my sister. Yeah, lights might need to go down. Is that possible at all? Just a little bit. It's They're not dimmable. Yeah. We then that's great. That's okay. Yeah. That's good. Perfect. That's good. Okay. That's my sister on the left there, and uh, that's me with the oversized screwdriver, which I assume would be used to stab her doll later. <laughs> this was the high school I went to, Kingswood Regional High School. Uh, pretty nice now. It's newly renovated. The one I went to, we called the plastic box because it was literally made of plastic. Not very good for the summertime. Uh, pretty bad fumes, I think. So anyways, uh, like sophomore year, I believe, uh, I'm sitting in study hall and a teacher came to me and said, um, uh, this woman, actually, who was a friend's mom, she said, would you be interested in trying out a Reiki class? Um, it's the first time they're ever offering this, and I had no idea what it was, but I figured, what the heck, I'll get out of, get out of class, so uh, sure, I'll do it. She's talked about uh, chakras and energy and, and all this stuff, and at the time I thought, well, this all sounds nice, but it probably is a bunch of crap. So, um, anyways, cut to about senior year, and, uh, you know, I thought this was my year. I'm a senior guy, time to get all the ladies. They always like the older guys. Well, they had no other <laughs> options at this point. I'm the older guy. Well, it was at this time that I uh, fell victim to a typical case of uh, teenage acne, which basically crushed my dreams forever. <laughs> so... For the next two years, I took an antibiotic called doxycycline. Uh, this helped clear up the acne, but like all good pharmaceutical drugs do, left me with even worse issues, uh, one of which was psoriasis. Uh, and where did that occur? On my face. Good stuff. So not wanting to turn to drugs again, I went down the rabbit hole of alternative medicine. I checked forums, CureZone, and all these websites and books. And uh, without much luck, after a little while, I went on Amazon and I said to myself, well, I haven't really checked out psoriasis on Amazon, I'll just plug it in. The first thing that came up was this book, uh, Healing Psoriasis, many of you may be familiar with, by Dr. John O.A. Pagano. Uh, it's published in 91, it's been on the bestseller list since 1990, uh, up until the present. Um, in the book, he basically combines the Casey readings with his Western, uh, his Western scientific study and has developed the Casey Pagano uh, treatment. Um, so I followed the, uh, the plan in the book, and I gradually got better. And I figured, you know, if this Casey guy is working for health stuff, well, what, is, what else does he have to say about everything else? So that brings us to Mr. Casey, which normally at this point in my talk I go all about Edgar Casey, but since we're at the Casey Center, I assume most of you know a lot about him. I'll make this pretty quick. Um, the most documented psychic of the modern age, uh, born in Kentucky, only had an eighth grade education. He had a throat illness where he couldn't speak for around a year, at which time a hypnotist came to his town. His voice came back. 
He did a private session and in trance diagnosed his own illness and said how he could heal it. So he uh, started doing readings at that point. Uh, in his lifetime, Casey gave over 22,000 readings, 14,000 of which are documented and available to the public. Um, all different types of readings, mostly uh, health readings, but basically every subject you could think of. Uh, where did he get his information? His readings said from the Akashic Record or from the higher minds, his higher mind and the higher mind of uh, his client. He demonstrated various spiritual abilities throughout his life. He could see auras. He slept on books and remembered the information. Um, famous clients he had were uh, Woodrow Wilson, Thomas Edison, uh, George Gershwin, uh, Nikola mm -hmm. Tesla. Famous predictions he made. He predicted the stock market crash. He predicted World War II, the pole shift, uh, convergence of communication systems, the Essenes. It would later be found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, blood being used as a diagnostic tool, uh, and the La Nina and El Nino weather effects. So, there have been countless books written about his life. Um, let's see, his last reading um, was on New Year's Day 1945. He announced that he would be buried on the 5th of January. He was right. He suffered from a stroke and died on January 3rd, 1945. He was buried in Riverside Cemetery in Hopkinsville, Kentucky. Now there have been countless books, like I said, written about his life. Most famously, There is a River by Thomas Sugru, and the New York Times bestseller, Edgar Casey, The Sleeping Prophet by Jess Stern. In these books, Casey claimed that his ability, his ability wasn't unique, and um, that everyone can learn to tap into the abilities that he demonstrated if they apply themselves. Um, Many, of peop many people, uh, including I'm sure a lot of you here, uh, you obviously know about Edgar Cayce, and for most people this is where the story ends. However, in a reading, Edgar Cayce, reading 254-53, question, in selecting an individual, individual as a leader or manager, do you mean the selection of a business manager or a leader? That is, should the business manager also be the leader of the new organization? The answer was this, certainly not. The leader will always be that one through whom the information comes, whether Edgar Casey or others that may be chosen, chosen to carry on, as Paul will enter in with the work. As Paul will enter in with the work. Paul Solomon, born 1939 as William Dove, he was born in Arkansas to a Baptist minister. As a child, he reportedly displayed paranormal behavior, such as seeing auras, which his parents believed to be derived from the devil. It sounds like a pretty similar story to Mr. Casey. Um, he joined the army, uh, became a preacher. He abandoned a lot of his abilities, which, being a Christian, he struggled with. Um, eventually, he, during what he called the dark night of the soul, uh, Paul became extremely depressed and eventually turned to a friend who was dabbling in hypnotism to try to help him. Paul was put under, and after he woke up, his friend excitedly claimed the responses to his questions during the session were not Paul's, but were from another source or something more powerful than Solomon's own mind. Knowing nothing about Edgar Casey at the time, Paul didn't believe him at first, but after more time and evidence, including a reading coming through Paul saying, before you guys are ready for this information, basically you need to spend six months, you need to do meditation, yoga, and you need to study the Search for God material from Edgar Casey in Virginia Beach. The reading even gave them the post office box to write to in Virginia Beach. So, after studying, after getting in touch with Casey, like I said, which at the time they knew nothing about, uh, he began his life's work of doing the channeling, giving readings from the higher source. He took on the pseudonym Paul Solomon to protect his private life as his fame grew. Living a shorter life, Paul only gave around 2,000 readings. Um, also, he became kind of frustrated at a certain point. He said most people don't really listen to their readings. They just get the information and then pretty much do what they were doing anyways. Um, so he dedicated a lot of his time to lecturing and teaching. Uh, like Casey, though, most of his readings covered uh, health, but uh, also like Casey, spanned uh, all the different topics. Where did he get his info from? The Akashic Record, along with the higher mind of himself and the client. Now, around the same time in Michigan, it was Ross Peterson. Ross was born in 1929. 
Ross, a.k.a. Peter Weber, uh, he fell off a truck, injuring his back. The osteopath was also an accomplished hypnotist. Through hypnosis, Ross's back pain was greatly improved, but it also had a few other effects. After a few strange incidents where he knew things that he shouldn't, such as describing a fight his osteopath had with his wife that morning over another man, he became intrigued about what he could do with this ability. At the same time, Ross was given a book by a friend. The book was Thomas Subaru's There is a River. Inspired by the writings, Peterson decided to take Casey literally at his word that anyone could do what Casey did. He was an unlikely candidate for a seer with a colorful past, including several marriages and time spent in jail. But with about four years of dedication and practice, or blood, sweat, toil, and tears, as he called it, he learned to enter the same state of deep trance. Over his career, Peterson gave approximately 12,000 intuitive readings on a variety of subjects, but like the others, much of the focus was on health conditions. Where did he get his information from? The Akashic Record, His Higher Mind, and The Higher Mind of His Patients. In a book by Alan Spraggett, Ross was called the new Edgar Cayce, and that book is on the table over there. So, knowing the, uh, that other prophets existed besides Cayce, I thought that was pretty cool, uh, more evidence to back up this ability, but unfortunately all of them have passed away. So I was on YouTube one day looking at an <coughs> Edgar Cayce video, and in the comments section, someone posted a comment, there's a man still alive in Canada doing what Edgar Cayce does. I was pretty skeptical at first, but that brings us to Douglas James Cottrell. Douglas was born in 1949 in Toronto, Canada, in a working class family. Before finishing high school, he took a job working on printing presses, eventually became a pressman for the Toronto Star newspaper. He was very skeptical of psychics, but his first child, Sherry Ann, was born with a number of difficulties that mainstream medical doctors could not explain. Douglas and his wife eventually relented to have the daughter put into a mental institution for crippled children in Belleville, Ontario. <laughs> Around this time, a co-worker at the Toronto Star handed Douglas a book uh, by Edgar Cayce, uh, on Edgar Cayce, which was There is a River. He became fascinated, wishing if only someone like Cayce was still alive to help his daughter. Shortly after, Douglas was working in his basement when he suddenly had the feeling to go upstairs and turn on the TV. When he did, it was none other than Ross Peterson, the man I just discussed, giving a reading on Alan Spraggett's program, ESP Extra Special People. Amazed, he contacted Ross and got a reading from him. In trance, Ross described trauma that Sherry Ann endured at birth, which was causing the epileptic seizures and gave treatments to heal her. On the strength of a single session, Douglas and Karen took Sherry Ann out of the institution despite resistance from friends and medical advice at the time. They applied the remedies Ross suggested to bring her back to health. The doctors said her life expectancy was 10 years. She lived to be 38. Inspired by Peterson, as well as Peterson saying in a reading that Douglas had the ability to do the same, Douglas began to explore hypnosis and meditation under the supervision of a family doctor to see if he could do what Peterson did. After years of practice, he was successful. Douglas eventually studied under Peterson. He gave uh, over 35,000 readings uh, to date. Clients all over the world, where does the information come from? The Akashic Record, Higher Minds, he's demonstrated various abilities, seeing auras, telepathy, etc., laying on of hands, counseled people all over, all, over the, all over the world, as I said, judges, CEOs, politicians, uh, some of his most well-known clients would be George Carlin, the comedian, uh, Joyce DeWitt, actress, uh, and Gina Sermonaro, which Jack mentioned, author of various Casey books. So at this point, I usually go on and uh, talk about what exactly it means to be psychic, but this is the Edgar Casey Center, so most of you are, are pretty familiar with that. We've all had a feeling someone, uh, we've thought about someone, they've called, we've had dreams that may or may not have come true, but we're not alone. Thomas Edison used a technique, he would sit in a lazy chair, hold two ball bearings in his hand, he would think of an idea, a topic he wanted an answer to, and as he fell asleep, he would drop the ball bearings, they would wake him up, and he'd usually get most of his inventions that way. The same happened to Salvador Dali with his art. Uh, he used a very similar technique, but with forks. Mozart used to wake up with whole symphonies playing in his head, which he would write down. You know this guy, Paul McCartney, dreamed a whole song. He woke up, wrote it down, recorded it, went on to become one of his all-time greatest hits. 
He said, my most known song is called Yesterday, and I woke up having dreamed that song. I didn't sit down and think about it, and it's one of, out of all my songs that people have played. More than 3,000 people have covered that song, so I must start to think that there's a paradox here. You know, I should have just sat down for three weeks and slaved over something that successful, but I just woke up one morning and had dreamed it. John Lennon frequently received inspiration in dreams. Johnny Cash, the idea of the trumpets in the song Ring of Fire came to him in a dream. And Billy Joel has always kept a notebook by his bed to jot down ideas, lyrics uh, for songs that come to him in dreams. So is the whole psychic thing really as out there as we think? Well, the word psychic comes from the Greek word skikos of the mental, soul, or life. Uh, divination has been reported in ancient cultures, uh, starting most likely with astrology. Mm -hmm. There are people known as seers or prophets, uh, later times as clairvoyance, the French word meaning clear sight or clear seeing. Goes back to the Bible, Corinthians. Uh, to one there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom, to another a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing, to another miraculous powers, to another prophecy, distinguishing between spirits, to another speaking in different kinds of tongues, and still another the interpretation of tongues. All these are work of one and the same Spirit, and he distributes them to each one just as he determines. Stories in the Bible of seers forming a, a functionary role, there's a story of when Samuel is asked to find the donkeys of the future King Saul. The role of prophet appeared in ancient cultures, constantly in Egypt, the priests of Ra at Memphis, acting as seers. Ancient Assyria, seers were referred to as Nabu, meaning to call or to announce, and the infamous Nostradamus. So, what is the source of information that everyone seems to be tapping into, and where does it come from? For me, I chose the most likely book, The Complete Idiot's Guide to the Akashic Record. <laughs> Akasha, translated as ether, is one of the five Hindu elements of earth, air, fire, water, and ether. It's a non-physical substance. Often described as a dimensional library, it's the template of all past, present, and future where all knowledge is stored. But that's nothing new. In the Judeo-Christian religions, the Book of Life is mentioned throughout the scriptures. The Egyptians called it the Hall of Two Truths. Accounts of accessing higher knowledge existed with the Celtic Druids, Tibetan Lamas, Middle Eastern peoples, ancient Mayans, and Native Americans. Also the Assyrians, Phoenicians, Babylonians, Hebrews, and Greeks was a common belief in the existence of tablets where spiritual wisdom and the Book of Life resided. Going into a little uh, of the science behind it, the equation E equals MC squared basically changed how we view the material world, saying that everything is made up Everything is the same, just vibrating at different rates of frequency. Theories like morphic fields, all species hold their evolutionary patterns and information in a field. Uh, the hundredth monkey eff effect, a uh, Japanese scientist studied a group of monkeys on an island. Younger monkeys started developing a new behavior of washing the sweet potato before they ate it. Well, after a critical number reached, the so-called hundredth monkey learned this behavior, Monkeys even off the island and other islands separated from this group all of a sudden started the behavior. We have studies coming out from the Institute of Heart Math showing that the heart generates a very large magnetic field uh, which contains information, even affects people at a conversational distance. The electromagnetic field of the heart influences brain patterns and brain waves from people that you're speaking to. Things like quantum holography, um, we see them mostly in these days as little uh, trinkets and whatnot, but the technology actually behind them is pretty fascinating because if you split a hologram into pieces, you can split it as many times as you want, but each piece contains the whole. And we're learning that in the universe. Every piece contains the whole. A couple of things I thought were interesting to show the interconnectedness of, uh, of nature, the 3D map of the internet a 3D map of the brain's neural network, and finally, iCloud. iCloud's the new storage device where basically you store all of your information, pictures, video, in this seemingly cloud-like ether of space, which you can then access from every device, showing that there is this field of information on the physical level, while reasonable to think that it could also take place on the spiritual level.
So how do they access the source? I believe it all has to do with inducing a state of altered consciousness. At the Delphi Oracle in Greece, the priestesses went into a trance before smoking dais and answered questions. The Old Testament, people were taken up in spirit to receive instruction. Hindu meditation enters different levels of awareness. And the infamous Mayan calendar, how did this come about? Well, written in Mayan codices are accounts of how the mathematician priests obtained the calculations. In some accounts, they smoked special tobacco and went into trances where they walked among the stars. Sounds a lot like high school for me. <laughs> the last method of this book, The Idiot's Guide, mentions Edgar Cayce. Edgar Cayce fell into a sleeping trance. I almost forgot someone else who's included on pages 82 and 88 is this guy. Which leads me to the one method I found that's reliable, accurate, does not require taking any special tobacco, and is the common thread between this man, this man, and these other two, which I've previously mentioned. And that's deep trance meditation. It's consistent, effective, uh, and one method that I found tying everything together. Deep trance meditation, it's like having one foot on earth and one foot in heaven, from Douglas Cottrell's book, Secrets of Life. And this can apply to any of these four men. He lays back in a reclining chair, closes his eyes, and begins to breathe deeply. Within minutes, Douglas has entered the state of deep trance meditation. It's as if his conscious mind has moved out of the way, fading into the shadows and allowing his contemplative mind to come forward. The contemplative mind is the consciousness of the immortal human soul. Unlike the rational mind, the contemplative mind is not bound by physical restraints of time or space. When the body is excited, agitated, or stressed, it demonstrates the ability of seemingly superhuman physical strength and speed. Likewise, when the body is profoundly relaxed, the mind becomes capable of seemingly superhuman mental feats. That's clairvoyance, clairaudience, clairsentience, precognition, premonition, and prophecy. As its name implies, DTM is a very deep, trance-like state of meditation. Some have described this as the twilight state between consciousness and sleep. In this altered state of consciousness, Douglas's respiration and heart rate are slowed, his blood pressure is lowered, and his brain activity changes. This is probably the most accurate diagram i found. I believe this came to Edgar Cayce in a dream. This is from the book, The Outer Limits of Edgar Cayce's Power, basically showing three individual people. Here you have the conscious mind of each person going up higher. You have the subconscious mind. And finally, the superconscious at the highest level showing that they're connected between all three individuals. So, four men, one method. That's Douglas about to give a reading. First, the body set aside, uh, at which point uh, the conductor looks for the rapid eye movement. Same thing with all these guys. At which point the conductor begins the script, which includes clearing the mind and reciting a prayer of protection for the channel. Uh, at which point the conductor needs to be found by the channel. Next is the client. The client needs to be found giving the name and location. It can be in person or an absentee, just like Casey. After both are found, the questions can be asked by the conductor or client. Any question goes. Uh, when the body is taken all it can, which is about after an hour, uh, the prophet will say that the body is becoming depleted and should be awakened, at which point you have about one or two questions left. And if you really push it at the end, it'll say, please awaken the body. Uh, you're pushing it, basically. So, at that point, the conductor directs the body back to, uh, to return back to normal, to heal itself if needed, uh, raise the body temperature, blood pressure, uh, etc., and eventually awaken. What do these men have to say about the various topics, ranging from health to spirituality to our ancient history and future? Keep in mind that it's not really what they think or have an opinion on. It's what's coming through them from a higher source of information, which is the superconscious tapping into the Akashic Record. So if this is true, shouldn't they be saying similar things on every topic? Let's find out. Health. Edgar Cayce says, disease first arises from a dis-ease, a normalcy that is existent and yet becomes unbalanced. Paul Solomon, see the revolution in medical science. 
the relationship between the thought and that which is embodied, that which produces dis-ease of all kinds. The process known as aging is in itself a dis-ease process that in itself may be healed by the overcoming of fear. Ross Peterson, take the word itself, for dis means without, ease is certainly self-explanatory. When a mind is without ease, the body becomes dis-ease. And Douglas, disease is simply being ill at ease. So what is natural, correct, or perfect? Uh, to counter this experience, enthusiasm, hope, love, joy, this will counteract the thoughts that cause disease in the body. That being said, it makes sense that nothing is incurable. Casey, there are in truth no incurable conditions. Paul Solomon, no disease that you could not heal if you accept the proper energy into the body. Ross, there are no incurable diseases, no incurable illnesses, only incurable attitudes of mind. Douglas, disease is simply that which should not be. For perfection and growth are of God. The mind. Edgar Cayce, for that which we find in the spirit takes form in the mind. Mind becomes the builder. The physical body is the result. Remember that mind is the builder. Mind is the builder. Mind is the master. The mind is the builder. The mind is the way. What is held in the mind is manifested in the body. Rarely is it the other way around. I'm sure many of us here are familiar with the Masuru Moto study, putting intentions and thoughts to water. He then froze the test tubes, um, took shots of the crystals that formed in each test tube, showing that the intentions clearly had an effect on the structure of the water molecules. And if it affects water in this way, our bodies are 70% water. Well, that just goes to show that uh, the mind is, in fact, the builder. This is a, a cool little one, the mighty almond. Hmm. Edgar Cayce says, an almond a day is much more in accord with keeping the doctor away than apples. Those who would eat two to three almonds each day <coughs> never fear cancer. Paul Solomon, better results from almonds as a source, uh, better as cancer prevention than treatment for most. At least one almond a day as a cancer preventive. And eliminate the cause and eliminate cancer cells. To some degree, the almond facilitates this as we have given a study conducted at Penn State concluded that the phytochemicals in almonds were helpful in inhibiting the cell growth in cancerous tumors. Because of the large amounts of vitamin E found in almonds, they can also help protect against certain cancers, such as prostate, cervical, lung, colon, and rectal. So if that's the case, what is the apple good for? The infamous apple fast. Casey, occasionally not too often, take the periods for cleansing of the system. The apple diet, at least for three days, Take nothing except apples, raw apples. No other foods but the raw apple. After the last meal, on the third day, drink a half cup of olive oil. It will cleanse to toxic forces from any system. Purification of the body by a three-day apple fast will cleanse the body. The apple, preferably the Jonathan, uh, for three days. A complete cleansing to take place of the digestive tract. Eat the apples for three days. It will act as a catalyst for the kidney, bring about a degree of removal of toxins out of the blood which would help impairments in the body. So at this point, uh, you could be saying to yourself, if you're a good skeptic, that maybe all these three guys just studied the Casey readings, all 14,000 of them, memorized them, and are just repeating the same things. Well, that could be the case if these guys didn't give individual health readings over years for countless people who, obviously in the 20s, where Casey gave readings for, are not in 2000. 14 getting a, a health reading from Douglas. So, how accurate are their individual readings? Let's see. Casey, in the book, is it true what they said about Kate, Edgar Casey? Lytle W. Robinson says Casey's physical health diagnoses and treatments appear to have the greatest accuracy. Hundreds of readings for specific individuals couched in correct medical terminology. Mm -hmm. Improvable instances turned out to be valid in that most difficult and convincing of tests, the cure. He correctly gave the temperature and blood pressure of unseen patients, described the location and cause of ailments, named the sex of unborn children. No linguist, he sometimes spoke in foreign languages for persons living in Europe. Participating and investigating doctors estimate his physical health readings to be between 85 and 90 percent accurate. Paul Solomon I don't have an exact number percentage for him, but I do have a story that he helped a young girl who her father ended up being a doctor from Yale. Uh, the doctor, after healing his daughter, 
had Paul lecture at Yale without Paul knowing that this was the guy. Uh, and Ross Peterson, the new Edgar Casey. Dr. Lee Poulos, a trained scientist, PhD in clinical psych from the University of Denver, has had several readings, studied the results, and he said, I would say that when Ross does physical readings, health readings, he's in the 90 to 95% accuracy range. <coughs> Dr. William Zwerick, chiropractor from Toronto, who worked with Ross's patients based on their readings, the overall assessment of Ross's spinal readings, he is 95% right, and perhaps that portion is even higher. In some cases, he's been virtually 100% correct. And finally, Douglas. Mike Solomon, the Mississauga News, 1978. Doctor claims psychic readings are 95% right. The health readings of a Toronto psychic are astounding in Mississauga doctor, who says the method, if it's scientifically proven out, could change the face of healthcare. Michael Bodner, a chiropractor operating on Mississauga Road, said in an interview Monday night that psychic Doug Cottrell of Langley Ave is 95% right, uh, about 95% of the time. Let me clarify that. He is right about 95% of the time. Cottrell has no training in medicine or health care. This is a, a brief example of uh, a health reading from him. Beginning in the uppermost portions of the body, there is in the neck both severe compression and mild rotation, approximating an S-curve affecting the seventh, sixth, and third cervical vertebrae as well as the atlas axis. The head is sitting crooked on the neck. Blood flow to the upper, upper areas of the cranium is somewhat restricted, causing mild oxygen starvation, etc. There's also a story I have on me uh, of a young girl who was basically given two weeks to live. Her parents had an emergency reading and she was taken off of life support and came back to life. In the reading, Douglas said that she had basically six days to decide if she was going to stay on the earth or pass away. He gave it, uh, recommendations, certain things like cranial sacral, uh, which they implemented and she survived. Purpose of life. For life is of the Creator, and it may only be changed, it cannot be ended or destroyed. It can only return from whence it came. Paul Solomon, come back to be one with God, simply by Ross to return to thy source. And to return to the Godhead, your soul must experience certain things. Only when this is done can they return from whence they came. So if that's the case, what is the source? What is God? The Lord thy God is one. Love is law, law is love, God is love. Love is God. Identify the source as well as you can. Understanding the nature of God, people think in terms of an all-powerful and even manipulative, rather than understanding pure love without fear. All force is one force. That force is God. For God is infinite, God is love, love is law, and law is God. And therefore the nature of God is love. Love that is perfect, omnipresent, omniscient. Only through perfection and love can you return to the Godhead. Well, at Douglas' Center in Canada, they have this poster basically showing how the foundation of all religions are saying the same thing, tying into the golden rule, treating each other as you would with love. The Akashic Record, which I touched on before, is the record of the individual entity that it writes upon the scheme of time and space. The records of every soul, <coughs> things that are recorded upon the scheme of time and space, the Akashic Record is the place where all knowledge is arranged. They all talk about certain laws of the universe. The law of karma is one of them, which in today's world we're a bit misunderstood. Um, the main message is that it's a law which you owe to yourself, not someone else. What you sow in the body, in the mind, and purpose, you must one day in the physical reap. Thus what you do to others, you are doing to thyself. Understand karma. That which any soul would meet on this plane is owed only to self. Each entity reaps as it, exactly as it's sown, the law is perfect. You meet yourself by reaping what you've sown in previous lives. Karma is something you owe yourself. In essence, a karmic debt is a debt that you have incurred previously in this life or another that you must pay back to yourself. The law of karma allows things to be given to you that you deserve and not one iota more or less. Uh, understand, you should have never been someone else. You have always been who you are, but you've traveled in various garments in various times. The purpose of the series of earthly lives is to return. And it's an ongoing cycle, a way back towards perfection. Well, this is the Samsara, the Wheel of Life in Buddhism. Uh, it's the six spheres of existence that we are all supposedly trapped in. 
and everyone uh, upon death will be re reborn in a higher or lower state, depending on their karma, good and bad deeds. The only way to break out is by obtaining enlightenment. Prayer. Why worry when you may pray? The energy of prayer is sent by thought. All prayer is answered. Don't tell God how to answer it. <laughs> the thoughts. That prayer sets in motion a cause that can and will move heaven and earth to produce a result. Prayer is thought. What thy thoughts dwell upon, that is the prayer. So be careful that which thou prayest may indeed come to thee. Mm -hmm. And finally, prayer is little more than the process of repeating some thought that is held in your mind. Usually a prayer voice is a desire to acquire something you believe you need or want, but simply put, prayer is what you think about. Heaven. All you may know of heaven or hell is within your own self. One of my favorite quotes, you grow to heaven, you don't go to heaven. <laughs> For where hath he promised to meet thee? Within the temple. Where is the temple? Where is heaven on earth? Within. Become as innocent as a child. Unless you do so, you cannot enter the kingdom. You must learn again to play. Heaven's a state of consciousness. The greatest power you have is thy will. So it depends on what you do with choice. And it's the way back toward perfection. Since that time, your soul has followed the course, meeting all things you've met before. Uniting again in heaven and with God. Luke 17, 20 and 21, Neither shall they say, Lo here or lo there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. You must learn to meditate just as you have learned to walk or talk, a tuning of the physical and mental to know the relationship with the maker, focusing the attention to relax, turning within to quiet the self, a period daily. Begin to practice on a daily basis. Eight to ten minutes, once or twice a day is enough. Bring peace to the body and mind. Bring control. It's the ability to listen to a higher force that lies beyond your conscious mind. We have 42 quotes in the Bible on meditation. We have Buddha here meditating on the lotus and the Hindu god Shiva, seen in, uh, often seen in immersed in deep meditation. <clears throat> Dreams. Dreams are symbolic. Dreams are that which comes from the subconscious, uh, interpret them in thyself. That's a big one. People, so many people turn to dream interpretation books and all this. Your greatest interpretation book is your own soul looking into yourself. Not by a dream book, not by what others say, but dreams are presented in symbols and in signs. One's own symbology must be established. No one else can interpret dreams for you unless there be the psychic or the intuitional interpretation. For the symbols that are established are within self. Symbols, native language of the unconscious mind, and literal and symbolic. They're in fact language of the soul. Everything that is done in the world first has been dreamed about. This is a big one. Two big steps if you want to become psychic. I'm a living example of this. I've been doing both of these practices and have noticed uh, leaps and bounds within myself. Two practices, dream interpretation and meditation. In meditation, looking within self, ask is this yes or no. The body may analyze dreams and interpreting the same even better. Wake up after the periods of dreams, record them, giving the interpretation. And secondly, stopping for meditation. Practicing meditation. Dream interpretation. Interpretation of dreams and meditation. Learn to relax the mind and disassociate the physical world from the mental world. One spot they all say. Bimini, off the coast of Florida. Atlantis will rise. It's already rising just north and northeast of Bimini. Discovery of underwater ruins off the island of Bimini. And east of Bimini, there will be large rises. Uh, you'd find here there would be a rise. In that, there would be the earth that would break the surface. It would not be as large and more pure mostly as a mountain, but it will rise. If only there was some evidence of this. <laughs> oh, wait, there is. On September 2nd, 1968, while diving in 5.5 meters of water off the northwest coast of North Bimini Island, uh, it was discovered an extensive pavement of what later was found to be noticeably rounded stones. The stone pavement was found to be to form a northeast linear feature, which is most commonly known as either the Bimini Road or Bimini Wall. It's been examined by geologists, uh, archaeologists, uh, some of which have uh, thrown it out and said these were formed by natural means. To that I would say, have you seen that right there? Um, that is the Bimini Road. 
Egypt. When Atlantis finally uh, had the final downfall, people dispersed to many places, but the main place was Egypt. Edgar Cayce, there was sojourning of those groups from the Atlantean land uh, towards the Egyptian land. The collapse uh, among those, this was given in a personal reading for someone, you were among those that went out to assist in repairing the work, entering into the area which you now call Egypt. Plain and simple, Ross, there was a large influx into what is Egypt. The continent broke into five islands. They dispersed to the four corners, corners of the world, northeast to Europe, east and southeast to what would be India, Pyrenees, Africa, into Egypt. Well, the Orion Mystery, uh, a book by Robert Bavall and Adrian Gilbert, they basically made a very interesting discovery where they turned back the clocks using software, uh, turned back the clocks of the Earth's skies, and the continent of Orion's belt perfectly lined up with the pyramids at Giza, at which time, 10,500 BC. Also, uh, the Great Sphinx is presumed to have the body of a lion, evoking the processional era of Leo. When did that begin? 10,900 BC to 8,700 BC. Uh, also, there's the weathering of the Sphinx by rainwater, which supports a date of construction around 10,500 BC. Uh, around the same time as the ground plan had been designed for the three Giza pyramids. This is what I mentioned before, uh, 1848, this was an archaeological expedition in Abydos, uh, discovered these hieroglyphs, showing clearly some flying uh, machines going on here. Um, they resurfaced uh, in the 1990s, uh, taken, put online. Um, this was a Obviously, a pretty astounding discovery, and many of you have probably seen it on shows like Ancient Aliens and whatnot. Um, and here we have uh, the ground plan of the uh, location of the, the plans that were surveyed um, by modern scientists using ground penetrating radar. Uh, this allows us to look below the surface of the land to see what's going on underneath. Two main spots that they found uh, possible shafts or tunnels. One close to the southern side of the first pyramid, and two around the causeway of the second pyramid. The prophets say that when Atlantis broke up, people dispersed and left records of their civilization in many places. Uh, a place, one of which is called the Hall of Records. And where's the chamber, they say? Under the right paw of the Sphinx. When the time is right, they say it will be uncovered and the information will be available. Last section, the future. What happened during the times of Atlantis is being faced now. This is the reason many of us are incarnating. Uh, the majority of us here right now had lives during Atlantis. You may believe that or you may not. But I know many people who have gotten readings in the ones I've studied were given past lives in Atlantis. <coughs> I'm one of them. Okay. Man eventually turned the crystal technology into the channel for destructive purposes. It's growing towards this in the present. There was upheavals, destruction that came to the land, as in the next generation must come to other land. For in that day they knew, even in this day, there's the calamities, catastrophes, understand children. You repeat that which was done in that day. And history never more so closely repeated itself and is happening that is occurring in this place in this time. Understand your purpose, then, for repeating that which was the life. There's danger again in arriving. What was lived in Atlantis is being lived now. Again, similar conditions in the world. For you see, the Atlanteans have again entered the earth to meet themselves, and that they would be their downfall for their blessings. There's not one leader in the world at this point in time who has not been a leader as to the continent known as Atlantis. Collapse of economy. Uh, unless there's more to give and take, um, there will be greater turmoils in the land. You are to have turmoils, you are to have strikes between capital and labor. The economy in this day is based on the ability of manipulation, artificial values of symbols. Uh, such manipulation, uh, they do not represent kind for kind, has led to a scandal you're experiencing now. Accompanying these tremendous cataclysms are economic collapse, Expect, therefore, more disruptions in government. This will awaken the general public. There will be violence in the street. This was before Occupy Wall Street. You'll find the use of gems, precious metals, coins, precious metal coins, things of that value, will once again surface. 
There eventually will be an entire change to the real property rather than promissory notes. The barter system will be well advanced by that point in time. Douglas was asked in one of his books on the Earth Changes, why did Edgar Cayce make all these predictions for 98 when they never happened? And the answer was, because people change. The point of prophecy is to wake people up. The point of prophecy is for it to be wrong. So we realize what we need to do and we change. Humans, as you know humans, as Douglas would say, don't do the right things, uh, do the right things but for the wrong reasons. And we don't do things until... Uh, it's just about too late. So that being said, the three main places that will be affected, LA, Europe, and New York. As to the physical changes, it will be broken up the western portion of America. The upper portion of Europe will be changed as a twinkling of an eye. Portions of the now east coast of New York, or New York City itself, will in the main disappear. Los Angeles will be among those that will be destroyed before New York even. New York City is not safe during a period of changes, nor is the immediate coastline closest to the city. The immediate coastline of California is not safe even now. Uh, the changing of the areas of northern Europe will change in the twinkling of an eye. What you call Manhattan must sink into the sea. Los Angeles will plunge underwater. Europe will vanish as in the batting of an eye. And Douglas, California west of the Rockies. There will be disturbances in the area of New York. There will be flooding. They also do talk about the Carolinas, great storms, rain, and flooding. Best to look to the mountain regions in Europe, once again disappearing in the twinkling of an eye. Well, we have reports by NASA showing that it's not just the Earth heating up, there's interplanetary climate change. Um, the whole solar system is heating up. People like David Wilcock are talking about this in depth. We're entering into a new energy. Um, the whole solar system is moving into that. So lastly, the Mayan calendar, December 21st, 2012. Well, we all know that that didn't happen. We are still alive. Um, but really, is that what they said? Well, many of the elders said, in fact, that's not true. Um, Lorenzo Barreno, a Guatemalan native who was trained by Mayan elders to read the ancient calendar, says, the apocalypse concept is a false interpretation of the long count calendar. He said the Mayan elders taught him that the December 21st this year simply marks the start of a new calendar. Rather than being the end of the world, Mayan priest Jose Manrique Esquive believes that 2012 may bring a transition to a better time for humankind. And that's exactly what these guys all say. It's a renovation. These changes in the earth will come to pass. The time and times are at an end, and they've been given those periods for the readjustments. For how hath he given, the righteous shall inherit the earth a period of development and destruction. We will remove ourselves from these places of false value and the expression of false value, and we will turn our time and attention to the things that are of great value. We will love one another, rather than accumulating that we can draw to ourselves and own and spend and be possessed by, we will rather give, give, give to one another. Know ye, in any suffering, any chaos, any disruption, there is a blessing if ye would but sift it out. It would be finding like, like finding a precious diamond in a mountain of coal, but it can be done. They return to the simple ways, they return to that which is the fulfilling of the purpose of life itself. And finally, every level of society is going through change, being modified or altered. The planet itself is changing its face. Out of this will come a time of peace, a time of prosperity and trade, but it will take some organization. All levels are changing, medical science, philosophies, theologies. Uh, remember, this is a time like a birth. Great difficulty, great travail, great pain. But as soon as the delivery is concluded, there is relief, and those things that are painful are forgotten, and those things that are beautiful are embraced. Those who have foreseen this time want to help the human race back to a point where there would be compassion, understanding, and care for all. So, at many mansions, Douglas's motto is, Faith is built upon belief, belief is built upon evidence. Through years of research, along with my own personal experience, I've come to believe that the sleeping prophets are an accurate, reliable, and profound source of information. The goal of this presentation is fourfold. 
First, I want to try to prove this form of prophecy, that it exists. Secondly, I want to show that everyone can do it, not just Edgar Casey. there have been others, and there will be others. Three, I wanted to answer some of the higher questions that I'm sure a lot of you who are Casey studiers probably already have some insight about, but for those who don't, it certainly changed my life in that way. And four, I want to provide a glimpse of some hope for the future. I hope I've done some of that tonight, and I thank you all so much for coming in.